Let's take our Bibles and look together in Acts chapter 22. We are study through this book that gives us how the Lord worked there in the first century and caused the gospel to be carried forward, particularly through the Apostle Paul. The other ends of the world, as Christ said, should be, beginning in Jerusalem and Judea, Samaria, other ends of the world. And the tumult that rose up against Pete to Paul here as he came to Jerusalem, and when they found out he was there, stormed against him. You say, well, what would cause such anger? I mean, I preach the message of Paul and the gospel, there's anger amongst enemies of Christ, but here to actually seek to kill him, as they did our Lord Jesus Christ. Yeah, we saw how the Lord intervened and how Paul, in the beginning of this chapter, verse 22, puts up his hand and wants to speak his defense. That's what we looked at last time, the defense of the gospel. It's not that the gospel needs defending, but when asked of reason of the hope that was with him, and that's then we speak. And so we saw last time how Paul really was giving the testimony, God's grace for him. That's really what it is to preach the gospel. If I'm standing up here preaching anything other than what the Lord has taught me by his spirit, then I'm a false witness. It's not just standing up and informing, but declaring how it is the Lord has been merciful to a sinner such as I am. And he shows them and tells them that he was of their number. He understands their anger. He understands that hatred, not just for him, but for his Lord. I've often said that the reason why people will attack us is because they can't get their hands on the Lord. He's in glory. And so they pursue and persecute those that are his. And as he's declaring this, comes to the toward the end of his testimony, that of how he persecuted and pursued those that were enemies, he considered to be enemies of Jewish tradition. And in verse 20, he gives this testimony that when the blood of thy martyr Stephen was shed, I also was standing by and consenting unto his death and kept the raiment of them that slew him. And he said unto me, this is the word the Lord speaking unto Paul, depart, for I will send thee far hence unto the Gentiles. Up to this point, he's speaking to them in the Hebrew language. They were hearing him clearly and not sure where this was going to go. But notice it says in verse 22, they gave him audience unto this word. Go back and look and think, well, what word? Well, that was the word Gentile. And that was the point of contention for these Jews that Paul would take what they considered to be their scripture, the Old Testament, because that's all Paul had at that time. We, when we're talking about him going forth and preaching the scriptures, it was the Old Testament. And what was he doing? Preaching Christ from the scriptures. He wasn't preaching laws and traditions. There's some preachers, when they stand up and announce their text that it's going to be in the Old Testament, you kind of hunker down because here comes the law. Here comes the, the whip with the ten prongs. And boy, they're going to work you over. Not the apostles. When you look at how the Lord taught them, and even our Lord himself, taking the Old Testament scriptures, he preached himself. There's never a time, I don't care what the book or verse or chapter, there's never a time that we're not to declare Christ and preach him from Genesis all the way through. And so we can see just how vehement was this to such a degree they couldn't hear anything else he said. Such was the prejudice in their own hearts against 
him going and preaching to the Gentiles. I think about how much prejudice there is in our own hearts and how much there is that keeps us from really hearing the word of the Lord, were not that the Lord should break through and cause us to hear. We stumble at his word. That's our nature to do. And it's only the Lord by his spirit that can be our teacher. So we see here now, suddenly, they lift up their voices in verse 22, and they said, Away with such a fellow from the earth, for it is not fit that he should live. And as they cried out and cast off their clothes and threw dust into the air, the chief captain commanded him to be brought into the castle. Here we see God's sovereignty in all things, ruling over all men. Here is a captain, a centurion of the Roman army, one of the more, most ruthless armies that ever existed in empires in the world. And yet, the Lord so directed him that he should be brought into the castle and away from this people. But at the same time, you can think about the centurion. He's thinking about his own honor. If I just take and defend this God, then they're going to be all over me. It's going to get back to Caesar. So it says he bade that he should be examined by scourging. We're going to get out of this fellow. What's going on here? That he might know wherefore they cried so against him. That's how the Roman Empire ruled. They beat you first and then ask questions later. Get it out. And as they bound him with thongs, it would have been some leather type bindings to some type of hole. Paul said unto the centurion that stood by, Is it lawful for you to scourge a man that is a Roman and uncondemned? This is a twist that the centurion hadn't even thought of, because here's a Jew, and he's standing there speaking in perfect Hebrew. In fact, the Lord gifted the Apostle Paul with many languages. I believe that's what he was speaking of there in 1 Corinthians, that he said he speaks in more tongues than they all. He's not talking about gibberish. He's talking about in his travels, having been, been gifted to go and preach in the the, name, the known languages, or you see tongues in Scripture, it either refers to this member here in our mouth, or it refers to a language, an understandable language, even on the day of Pentecost. Those that heard the Galileans speaking, it names the countries from which those people had come to Jerusalem, and they heard each one speaking in that language. So listening to Paul, all the centurions thinking, oh, this is just the Jewish problem. This is one of the Jews, and so we're going to find out what the issue is. But Paul said, wait a minute. Is it lawful for you to scourge a man that is a Roman and uncondemned? And when the centurion heard that, he went and told the chief captain, saying, take heed what thou doest, for this man is a Roman. In Romans chapter 13 the scriptures say there's no power that exists but what God has ordained it. So think what you want about the Roman government or about any government under which we live. The Lord is able to use them for our protection. I've said before that I'm thankful that even now, as bad as things are in this country, that we continue to enjoy religious freedom for some representatives that are there in Washington, D.C., and that's all they can preach and talk about is religious freedom. Well, whether you realize it or not, that's protecting us. They may not know our God. They may not know or believe in our Lord Jesus Christ, but I'm thankful for those that the Lord has placed in those positions that enable us to drive in here like we did today on a beautiful, sunshiny day and sit and listen in freedom and worship God according to how he's been pleased to teach us. So I see here the Lord working. These were men. These were ruthless men. These were powerful men. Remember, these are the ones that crucified our Lord. But the Lord so purposed that he should be delivered, as, as Peter preached on the day of Pentecost. Delivered up to wicked hands to be crucified and slain, but he says it was according to the, the eternal counsel and the foreknowledge of God that he did so. There's not a thing that takes place 
Oh, that we could see this completely. Not a thing, whether it's the crowd raging in that moment and then now pulled into a, a castle to be beaten and suddenly now, nope, we're going another direction, which here is going to be having to stand behold before the Sanhedrin. So he had enemies on every part. Once he was done there, they, they delivered more of the Sanhedrin. And here it was said, this man is a Roman. So then the chief captain, verse 27, came and said unto him, Tell me, art thou a Roman? And he said, Yea. Some of us might read that, yeah, but it's actually yea. Of a truth. And the chief captain answered, Now here's here is the entire sum of the gospel in one verse. Have you ever had that? come to pass with you at some point where in a conversation whereby people would never listen to you and open this word and declaring it and speaking to them of Christ, yet something in your conversation, out of it comes now a clear declaration of what it is to be justified, sinner justified before God. That's what I see right here in verse 28, and that's why the, the title of this message is Free Born. Because that's what the scripture says here. And the chief captain answered, With a great sum obtained I this freedom. So he, this captain is saying, Now wait a minute, don't be just speaking off the cuff here. This captain was evidently somebody that had to buy his citizenship. And one of those perks, if you will, of buying his citizenship, Citizenship may well have been having to serve in the Roman army, be part of that system, to buy into it. But Paul said, I was free born. I was free born. Back when I was growing up, there was a song called Born Free, but it really isn't the same sense as free born. Born free means I can I'm free, I can live however I want to. Free born means that I have received a privilege and a benefit of which I had nothing to do. When I was born, it was already done. It was already accomplished. And I live with the benefit of that, of someone else having earned that freedom for me. That wasn't an easy thing. But it's interesting when you go back and read the history of Tarsus, where Paul would have grown up, that that was a city whereby Mark Anthony, one of the Roman governors back in the day, declared that any one born in that city, because Mark Anthony had fought to free it, and that was one of his things that he said, from here forward, anybody born in this city of Tarsus would be born free, freeborn would have come in with the full rights of citizenship just like anybody else. I, I think about even my citizenship as a, a citizen of the United States of America. I was born a United States citizen, but there was a war fought. There are people that bled and died for this freedom that I enjoy today. That's a picture of the work of the Lord Jesus Christ. We don't earn by paying the rights to become a citizen of Christ's kingdom or earn in any way our way into Christ's kingdom. You can't do it. It's impossible. There might be ways like this centurion did it or this captain did it that allowed him then to have that citizenship. But that's not the way it's going to be with regard to God. There's nobody that is going to earn their way into this salvation that Christ has wrought on behalf of his people. And that when we are born, I believe that the scripture speaks of there's a physical birth, but there's also the spiritual birth by the Spirit of God. We don't even have anything to do with that. Christ, in speaking to Nicodemus, said that, that as the Spirit as the wind blows where it listeth, so the Spirit of God works in those who are born from above. 
But even when the Spirit is given, it's not then that we are justified before God. This was wrought well before we were born. It's like Paul's declaring here. I was free born. In other words, this was already worked out on my behalf. And my being born didn't, didn't change in any way what I was as a, as a free born. I think that's the way it is with the Lord Jesus Christ. A lot of people try to place it sometime in man's experience that it's when they believe that they're justified or it's when they believe that somehow now their, their status changes before God. No, he purposed our salvation from eternity, but Christ came and worked it out. If there was one that earned that right to citizenship for sinners such as we are, it's the Lord Jesus Christ. And now he ever lives to intercede on behalf of those for whom he paid the debt. And as the gospel is preached, the Spirit of God, he opens the ears of those sinners. There's many that won't hear. There's many that are going to be like these crowds or even this Roman centurion that can't appreciate it, can't enter into it because they're left to themselves. But I'll tell you who it impacts. It's the one free war. So this is where Paul speaks of this. And you can see the consequence in verse 29. All of this, I believe, is an illustration of the gospel. Because I love this word, then straight away. There's no argument here. This is settled law. This has been established. That if indeed he was born a free citizen, there's nobody that can ever take it away. And I say the same thing. There's a settled law. There's a settled law rule established by God himself that all those for whom Christ has paid the debt, guess what? They're free. That's why when Robert was reading that in Galatians chapter 5, Paul said, stand fast therefore in the liberty wherewith what? Christ has made us free. It's all in his work of righteousness imputed his shed blood accomplished here at the cross. If you ask a child of God when it was that he was justified before God, he'd have to say it's when Christ paid the debt. Because that's what God looked to. Even on the Mount of Transfiguration, when the Lord caused uh, Moses and Elijah to appear on that mount, what were they speaking of? It says they were speaking of the death that Christ should accomplish. The death that he should accomplish. All the hope of those in the Old Testament, just as all the hope of any since the cross is in that cross. And therein is our freedom. And that's why Paul declared, don't let anybody take that freedom away from you. That's why you say, well, I thought Paul was a spiritual man. Why is he appealing to his Roman citizenship? Because that was his justification. Why is it that we're always talking about the work of Christ at the cross and not giving any credence to man's experience or People try to pull you off that onto something else because that's where the work was accomplished there at the cross. And I love the word straight away. They departed from him, which should have examined him. What does the scripture say? There is therefore now no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus. And the chief captain also was afraid. Oh, that the, the, the world would be fearful of ever speaking out against one of the Lord's children for whom he's paid the debt. The Lord doesn't treat it lightly. Even with Paul himself, when he confronted him there on the road to Damascus and brought him low, he said, Saul, Saul, why persecutest thou me? What he was doing to those who were the Lord's, he was doing unto the Lord. And there are times in God's purpose he may, just like with Stephen, Give them that liberty to, to take one of his own out of this world, the Lord's sole purpose. But I'll tell you this, unless those that go after any of the Lord's are one of the Lord's themselves, as was Paul, and in time he draws them to himself, they stand condemned before the Holy God. There's nothing that can change that. But here he feared. There's no fear of the Lord today. Fear of coming in any other way than what God has ordained. Religion has people doped like a drug where they don't feel anything because everybody's telling them you're going to be all right. When in reality, how they are living is exactly contrary to Christ and his glory. 
But here, the chief captain also was afraid for personal reasons. He, he didn't want to lose his position. He didn't want this getting back to Caesar. There are a lot of people that will change their ways out of fear of judgment, but not necessarily out of fear of having been wrong. And it's the same today. People come sit and listen. They get stirred up a little bit in their minds and they think, oh, I, I better straighten up. I better go make some things right. That, that doesn't change your state before a holy God. But he was afraid after he knew that he was a Roman and because he had bound him, and it says on the morrow, because he would have known the certainty, wherefore he was accused of the Jews, he loosed him from his bands and commanded the chief priests and all their council to appear and brought Paul down and set him before them. Isn't it interesting how everybody wants to wash their hands? All right, he's a Roman citizen, but I'm going to turn him back over to this Jewish council and let them deal with him. But even that, the Lord was working. We know how... They dealt with our Lord Jesus Christ. They had to call false witnesses even to get to a point to accuse him unto death. But even in that, the Lord was working. The Lord was accomplishing his purpose. And that's the thing in which we can rest, that none of what we live or how we live or what takes place can happen unto any one of us but what the Lord himself has purpose. I don't know about you, but it helps me when I consider the different things that I face in my life. Sometimes you get looking at the object. You're looking at who's doing it to you. And all the while forgetting that even in that, they couldn't speak or move or lift their hand or accuse or do anything but what the Lord has so purpose and directs. And when you can see the hand of the Lord even in the things that are contrary, that he brings our way to affect us and cause us to look unto him, that in that we can see his grace and his mercy. But as we've seen up to now, everything that the Lord has purposed, he is going to accomplish. He's, he, he accomplishes according to his will. And as I said, bringing even Paul into this situation, which I'm sure gave him occasion even to ponder even more perfectly his own state before God. That just as a Roman citizen, he was protected under that law from any sort of condemnation, freeborn. Stop and think about what that means for us if we're the Lord's. How because of his work accomplished, how because of what he has done on behalf of those that are his, that we enjoy this freedom, that we enjoy what it is to be in him. Now only those for whom he has paid the debt can truly enter into it. Those that he has paid the debt and so taught by his spirit, because we might well be, when we first start out, opposed. We might be just like this crowd that rose up against Paul and said to him, away with this fellow, away with this fellow. He's not fit to live on this earth. He's not fit, as it says there in verse 22, that he should live. I don't know as we truly understand. We should, because such was our end. Before the Lord, it pleased the Lord to reveal Christ in us, that we have within us the same hatred toward the Lord and toward those that are his. And thankfully, we don't know all the thoughts of people against us because of what we enjoy in Christ. This stands opposed to all of their traditions and their, their works and their, their preaching and teaching. And when you come, just like they did with our Lord Jesus Christ, when all he did was speak to a man and said, Thy sins are forgiven. They, they were in an uproar. But Christ doing that was declaring not only he, he had the power to deliver any sinner as he purposed, but this, by declaring that, this was a sinner for whom he came to pay the debt. He wasn't just saying your sins are forgiven. He was looking on one for whom he would go to the cross and lay down his life. But their reaction against him is the same as it 
is against all and any that can stand for this truth today. There's going to be an uproar. They're thinking whether they do it or not. I've never had anybody cry out and cast off their clothes and throw dust in the air yet, but in their minds, that's what they're thinking. This message of freedom in Christ, whereby Christ has paid the debt, so stands opposed to what they know and think and believe that they would rather you be gone. They would rather not hear any more of you. Just as soon be dead as to have to listen to, to someone declare a message that gives Christ all the glory and uh, denounces any of the works and traditions of, of men and their ways. So this is a great chapter that we see here as to how the Lord was directing Paul's path. We're going to get into chapter 23 little bit next time will be actually week after next next week we're going to be around the Lord's table and so we'll be directed another way but I pray that what we've heard today give us pause to think about what we enjoy that if we are in Christ it is because of his great work accomplished for sinners such as we are and to him be all praise honor and